name's John Jansen. I'm uh, the moderator for today's session. Uh, we'll be talking about smart schools today. And um, let me just tell you what the uh, general focus is that we're going to talk about the classroom of the future. Uh, what will it look like? Will it actually include kids getting together in a classroom? There's a good question. Um, uh, what kind of technology is being used and will be needed for the future classrooms? Uh, we have speakers today from uh, the STEM education program. Uh, does everybody know what STEM stands for? See a fair number head nodding, one or two maybe not. That would be uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, we have a speaker from UEN, the Utah Education Network, iSchools, and the State Office of Education. They're going to help us uh, think about how we are preparing today for, uh, and what we actually will need to prepare for the future in terms of capacity and technological needs. So they're, they're each going to uh, provide an overview of their programs and we'll kind of take a higher look at this for a moment and then try and zero in a bit more to the local level. Our first speaker is Rick Gaysford with the educational technology, he is an educational technology specialist from the Office of Education for the state. Uh, the second is uh, Jeff Egley who is with UEN, has uh, 25 years of experience working in information technology. Uh, he's an associate director of the Utah Education Network. Jeff oversees UEN field operations. Our third speaker is Jason Cross. He's the director of education at the iSchools campus. And our last speaker is Meredith Manibach. If I got that? Manibach. Manibach. It's close. Uh, with the STEM. Action Center, and uh, she's had 15 years of improving organizations and their constituencies and partners, and actually focuses on community outreach as one of her specialties. So we're going to go through and have uh, the presentations from the four speakers, and then we will open it up for questions, and if we don't have too many questions, we've got some questions prepared that we could all talk about. So. We hope this ends up being a conversation, and uh, we hope we don't get too many glitches uh, or errors or whatever. Okay. So with that, uh, Rick, you're first. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, and it's a thank you for uh, taking time to, to come and to, to learn a little bit about what we're doing in education and how that relates to uh, this conference in, uh, you know, in broadband. Uh, which is very important for how we want to move uh, uh, education forward and the use of technology in that. Uh, beginning in 2011 and finalized in January of 2012, uh, the, state office, the State Board of Education approved a document called Highway to Our Future, um, which is technology standards for schools and for districts. Not looking at what students should be doing with, um, with, with technology particularly, but really more focus in what does that school of the future look like? How is technology going to be brought into the schools and how is it going to uh, affect uh, education? And what do schools need to know and do to be prepared to make that happen? And so we began this, we, we developed these standards and the standards covered three, ba three areas, access to the technology, professional learning, and technical support realizing that all three of these have to be addressed simultaneously and they all have to move forward. Otherwise, the, uh, use, the use of technology will never really be fully realized. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to, if you'll just go to the, uh, just start, just sort of at a, at a high level view of what these standards um, really, what they really uh, talked about in that. And when we looked at these standards, uh, pulling out some of the things that are in them, one of the things that they call for is that as we look at the future in that, and the classrooms of the future, all students would have a device. Uh, what that device is will be left up to, uh, to, local, uh, to local districts and to local schools, how that's, and how that's going to be implemented will be, um, will be put up, will, will be up to uh, you know, local levels to, to make those decisions in that. 
iSchool campus who is here with us today is going to talk is going to talk a little bit about what that can look like when it's actually being implemented into the um, into the system and that and then we started looking at also how you know if we're going to try to get the data that we need um, from schools eventually if we want to have the kind of data that would inform instruction on a daily basis in classrooms we really do need to have all students having a device so where are we at at this point if we go to the to the next slide well, currently in Utah, we have about 600,000 students and we have about 200,000 computers. So roughly we have about a three to one uh, ratio of uh, students to computers. Um, now, if you look at that in the perspective of, of business and that, just imagine every three employees having to share, uh, share a computer um, or a, a device in that. It would really limit productivity. Um, one of the other problems as you look at this chart up here is it, as you look at these graphs up here is it, it sort of breaks it down well what are what are those um, what, are, what are the age of those computers and what you find out is about 60 to 70 percent of the computers are three or years or older and about 25 percent of those are six or seven years or older so think about the kind of technology that you're you that might be being used in the world today um, and the refresh cycle that's on most of those it's usually on a three or four year re refresh cycle and nobody would be using a computer that's 10 years old. But that is the reality in our in, in classrooms across the state. So what would it cost to bring um, technology uh, to that one-to-one -one level? Uh, again, looking at, you know, where would, we, where would we come from? And so this chart sort of just says, if you wanted just to maintain that 200,000 computers just going forward and just that you're, and you're satisfied with that, you can sort of see if you did that on a three or four or five year ro you know, rotation cycle, uh, how many computers that you would need each year, and then depending on the price of the device, anywhere from 250 to $1,000 uh, per device, you can see how expensive that can get. It can range anywhere from about 16 million, or you can see all the way up to, uh, what is it, about 40, 50 million dollars a year. That has to be an ongoing amount. Now, how much is currently being allocated in Utah um, for technology in schools? Just as a, you know, as a reality check here. Last year, that was 6.6 .6 for just technology in schools. That was, and that's to cover everything. This is just the device cost. Uh, there's a whole lot more that goes into that, uh, uh, you know, as, we'll, as, I'll, as, I'll, as I'll get into a couple of things here. Um, if you wanted to increase that so that you went to a two to one ratio, if we go to the, the next one, then you can start seeing that the numbers begin to change. And if you really want to reach the goal of every student having a device that would be refreshed on some kind of a cycle, either a three, four, or five year cycle, then you hit the last chart here and you begin to see the, the cost of that um, can be anywhere from uh, 50 million on to 100 million dollars per year every year and that has to uh, be continued. Uh, the thing is that with funding that we're currently getting it might be 6 million this year and 2 million the following year and it could end up being zero if it's a bad year. Try to do planning on a budget cycle like that makes it very difficult so there has to be a, a relook at how uh, we, we think about this and how we, and how we build this in. In, into budgets and that. Um, <coughs> then you have to also start looking at the network infrastructure needs. Um, and, you know, Jeff, as he talks in just a few minutes, is we are blessed in Utah to have great broadband connectivity to the school. But then what happens when you get internal to the building? What kind of network is in the building? And we did an, just an analysis and we figured that uh, if you have about a thousand student school, it would probably cost about $50,000 to upgrade the network. Um, currently, about 20, of, 20 to 30% of the schools um, may have an adequate network. So we're really looking at that other number that we need an additional $43 million just to upgrade the network infrastructure internal to buildings. Then we have to start looking at how do you support all of those machines, and then you also have to add the, in the professional development cost of teachers, administrators, uh, parents, and students. All of those have to be considered. And that's what these technology standards uh, really try to address. Given all of that, if you'll just go to the, to the next one, we are making some inroads and we're trying some programs to see how this works. 
One of those is the Smart School Program, and uh, that'll be talked about here by Jason in just a few minutes. But you can see that we're currently working in, uh, uh, right now, in 10 schools in the state, where we have transformed those schools into one-to-one -one schools. Uh, the cost is fairly expensive right now, but it's giving us some really good information about what works. How do you go in there and build the infrastructure? How do you deploy, deploy devices? And then how do you train the teachers and what kinds of things can you do with the curriculum to be able to make that happen? Additionally, could just go to the next one. Um, and if you'll just go, those are the schools that we started with last year um, in, in, in rural U, in three schools. And then this year, these are the schools. But we do have a lot of other districts who on their own initiative are also doing similar types of things along this, uh, you know, as you can see across the state, that where they have implemented in one form or another one-to-one uh, -one projects in schools completely. The, the point is, is that all of this means that we have to have adequate broadband, we have to have access to devices, we have to have professional learning, we have to have technical support. If we can move all of these things together forward, we really can, I think, transform education and to make it um, a much more dynamic and engaging uh, education that will be what, that we, what we need if we want to grow the economy in this state. Because if we want to bring companies and that into this state and create new jobs, we've got to have an education system that's going to match that. Good morning. Um, I'm Jeff Egley. I'm with the uh, Utah Education Network. Uh, and I'm uh, going to just share a little about uh, what we do. And, and before I get started, I, I, you know, I see some familiar faces from the education side, from service providers. But who here is not familiar with Utah Education Network? That's, that's great, because often I find that in, in certain audiences, we're just below the surface. And a lot of folks might not be aware of uh, what we do and what UEN's role is with, with education. And uh, as we talk about smart schools, uh, UEN is one of those building blocks to the, the end game of, of smart schools. So if you'll, you'll flip that. Uh, just to give you a little background, um, UEN is an education technology partnership. Um, we work with higher ed, public ed. We're unique in the sense that there's not a lot of state networks for education across the country that actually work with both higher ed, public ed, and, and libraries. And uh, I think it's been very successful. We've been doing this for a long time. Uh, a couple of years ago, actually 2012, there was a change in to how we're uh, governed. Uh, we now have a 11-member a, a governing board that manages what we, what we do, helps set priorities, manages uh, our budget. And uh, we can go on to the next slide. But uh, I think the key to how UEN does what it does is the partnerships that it has. Uh, UEN is really a, a public-private relationship. We leverage what's called E-rate, which comes out of the Universal Service Fund, to help offset the cost to build infrastructure to, uh, to school districts and to schools. And uh, as we do that, we also are a community anchor that helps plow in that fiber, get that infrastructure into those, uh, those communities. And those dollars that come out of everybody's Universal Service Fund uh, bills each month go back into those communities and go back to those uh, providers and I think have a, even a greater impact as Glenn talked about earlier that 97 percent of Utahns are are connected and so that's how we do that and I think it's been a very successful model. We also partner very closely with with the school districts, the charter schools, the libraries, the the colleges and universities. We have to collaborate, we succeed together and we work very closely together so well, I'll be talking about the, the broadband components that UEN brings to the table to help support this. There's a number here that are within the, the K-12 environment, and they're living with how do, you, how do you put in the internal wireless and wired infrastructure, and I think we could probably solicit some really great input and comments from some of you uh, here today. Go ahead. So UEN, one of the key services we provide is broadband. And it was interesting, in the earlier discussion, they're talking about gigabit. Gigabit to get out to, uh, to uh, the community, out to the schools, out to higher ed. UEN, working with providers, started doing gigabit over 10 years ago. And uh, uh, at that time, I think it was unheard of that we could, we could do this and working closely with 
with our districts, our, our, our stakeholders, as well as providers, we for the most part have gigabit to uh, schools throughout the state. There are cases where we have lower bandwidth, but primarily we have gigabit services or 100 meg services to the, the schools around the state, which puts us actually a leap ahead of a lot of our counterparts out of state for the very reason that we've learned to come to depend on the fact that the bandwidth is there now we're starting to have to address how do we get more bandwidth because the needs, the way we depend on it, cloud-based services, district-based services, centralizing file servers, things like that have really uh, been adopted with, with all of education. Um, the other part that Rick alluded to is we're bringing these big pipes into the schools, into the districts, but there's still the constant effort to keep up within the district ensuring that they have the, the adequate wireless density to support what, uh, what uh, the students and teachers need, as well as bring your own device. All these, these uh, wireless and handheld devices that are coming into the schools, how do you manage them? How do you secure them? How do you ensure that uh, appropriate content is all that the students are, are accessing? And so uh, we're just part of that puzzle, and we do it uh, really in a, in a partnership, collaborating with our, with our stakeholders. Uh, we also have, and I'll just touch on that, some of the solutions that education uses, but only, only a piece of that puzzle. We do web conferencing, we, do, we have a large video uh, conferencing network uh, for uh, distance education, we have Pioneer Library, uh, some of us know us more by KUEN, the broadcast side of us, but the network and all of those education solutions that we provide are really the, 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 a big part of what we, what we do. So when we come to a school, they're getting first wide area connectivity. We're helping them tie their, their schools, elementaries, up to high schools, back to their districts. We're also providing them access to the internet. We're trying to make it as reliable as possible. We have alternate internet points across the state so that uh, there's always access. Um, also internet too, and so within Utah, we are the pop for internet too, and we extend that uh, connectivity out to the uh, uh, to the districts and so as Glenn was talking about some of the things US Ignite wants to do there's other programs that evolve around internet too that uh, those resources and that access is available through through UEN content filtering I mentioned E-rate with K-12 we bring in these pipes we work with the districts but that's that's part of the Child Information Protection Act and, and that's essential and required uh, uh, for uh, internet access into uh, K-12, and network engineering, constantly working with, with our stakeholders and the providers as we design and try to make the network for the future that meets the needs of, uh, of education. And so that's what we do. We're really part of this puzzle. There's more that comes to that, making sure that even with these big pipes, there's the right throughput, there's not bottlenecks, because there's always another challenge just to, to ensure that everybody has a seamless, low latent connectivity that, they, uh, that they're looking for. So just to give you kind of a brief high-level view, UEN connects every corner of the state. We go out to Manila, we go down to Navajo Mountain, Grouse Creek, which was mentioned earlier today. We have a robust backbone. Uh, by the uh, end of this month, first of November, it'll be 10 gigabit all the way to St. George. Right now it's 10 gigabit from Logan to Richfield. So it's a very robust, reliable network that I think really helps uh, the districts think about locally what do they need to do within their district and not have to worry about will I have enough bandwidth coming to my locations to do what they need to do. And the next slide just gives you a little more local look. Uh, these are just secondary schools within uh, Utah County so as we drill down you can just see how we extend out and we have multiple connections coming out from UVU which is our local pop going to Richfield going to Salt Lake Community College, going to the University of Utah, and soon going to the new downtown data center in, in Salt Lake City. So that gives you kind of a snapshot of what we do to help support this effort because a robust, reliable, low latent network is essential for supporting these kind of efforts where we want to do one-to-one -one computing, bring your own device, and, and smart schools. So uh, I appreciate getting to participate in today's discussion. Thank you. Great, well I'm gonna stand up as well. And I'm a very visual person, so I'm gonna show some, some pictures. My name is Jason Cross, and I am with iSchool Campus. 
And iSchool Campus comes into these, uh, these different school districts and, and different small schools. And we kind of help with what was kind of mentioned earlier, with where, where we, get this, uh, we get this great connection to the schools, but then what happens, right? And a lot of schools don't have the infrastructure inside the building to actually make them function correctly. And a lot of schools have no idea really how to do a one-to-one -one classroom environment. And I also, um, in, in my time, I, I've spent time as a teacher in technology. I spent time as a principal in a one-to-one -one technology school. And uh, now as director of education for iSchool Campus, I get, to, I get to think a lot about why is technology not the main thing in schools? Why are we not just using technology all the time in schools? What is, what is up with that? Because we've been trying for years. And if we think about it, and I, I show this picture up here because I think it's interesting, the 1950 workplace. And if you guys close your eyes, you can imagine what your workplace looks like. And I don't think it looks like that. And so we know that technology has had a tremendous impact on the private world, right? We, we work completely different than we do um, nowadays. Well, go ahead and flip that slide for me. Here's the 1950s classroom, right? Books, desks, overcrowdedness, everything that we see today in schools, it existed in 1950. Go ahead and flip the next slide. And in the modern classroom, so in, I love this picture because this is right out of one of the classrooms I visited. And what I think is funny about this is that all we did really is move the desks in a different direction. That's really the innovation that we've had over the last 60 years in schools. Um, they're still using you know, stuff. You can see there's a digital whiteboard up on the board, but I mean, really, is that a transformational technology? I don't know. We're going we're gonna to kind of talk about that. But when I think about that, I, I try to figure out why is there this, uh, this limitation to be able to bring technology into schools. And every school I go into, I always ask, where, where do you keep all of your old computers? And they always have a computer dungeon somewhere in every school building. And it's where all of their technology goes to die because it never really lived up to that expectation. It never became transformational so that it was needed. It never was something you had to have in school. It was always something that you added to school. Well, at iSchool, we're committed to trying to find that connection to make it to where this is a transformational technology. The way we'll get it into all of the schools is that it will be needed. The things that you can do in the, today's modern technology school cannot be done without the technology. And that's really the, the biggest difference. But one of the things, go back to that, I'm sorry. One of the biggest things is that technology adds a layer of prerequisite skills to your instruction. And this is often overlooked because we typically put technology in middle schools and high schools. And we think, here you go, go for it. Well, I want you to think for just a second, if you went through kindergarten through fifth grade and never had access to a pencil and pen. So from kindergarten through fifth grade, that was not a prerequisite skill that you were given. And then come middle school, they hand you a pen and paper and say, what I'd like you to do is please write me a paper. And I'd like it in APA format. I'd like you to use all the correct um, terms, everything, just, you, just go for it there would be a really big disconnect. Some of the kids may have had a pen and paper at home, so they may be a little ahead of the rest of the class. Other kids would have no idea where to start. And it's very frustrating because the teacher has to begin from, from the very, very beginning and start to teach them how to form letters on a page and how to do all of those things. That's actually what happens with technology as well. We don't give technology to kids early on. We give it to them later on. And they don't get that layer of prerequisite instruction that they need. So it's frustrating for the teachers. And so this is ultimately what happens. Go ahead and flip to the next slide. This is called the SAMR model. And this is a, a model that kind of shows us how we move up the chain in our, our process to bring technology into the classroom. So these, these bottom two levels are called the enhancement um, phases. And that's where really the, the technology is a substitution for pen and paper. So if you uh, can write a paper on with your pen, you can also type it. Right? No real significant influence. It's just a slight augmentation of a process we already do. It's not really that impactful. In fact, you guys would probably think of your days of technology where you just wanted to write a paper and it didn't work, it didn't save, it, something happened, right? So it's actually more difficult in some cases to use than pen and paper. Well, what happens is eventually, if you, if you stick with it and you bring in the prerequisite knowledge and you, you move up this chain, you start to get to where the tech allows for significant task redesign. And this is really where with STEM, it's, it's just a fantastic idea. Because when you're implementing one-to-one -one schools, and now the students are becoming creators with the technology instead of just consumers of the technology, you get a very, very transformational impact. 
So I, I ran a school in uh, Colorado. That's where most of my experience is. And we started with a program where we taught coding to kindergartners. And by the time the kindergartners were in third grade, those kindergartners had all of the prerequisite knowledge to do just about anything with, with the technology. They were writing software apps by third grade and, and just having a transformational impact on their education. And when other uh, families would drive 40 miles each way to come to my school, they would say, I'm driving here because I can't get that anywhere else. That's when you know you're really in that transformational stage. And I think that's where we want education to go. We want education to be transformational in these classrooms. That's what, the, what needs to happen. And so as we look at when we bring all this bandwidth into the buildings, we need to also give all of the kids the tools that they need to have. But then we also need to think about what are those prerequisite skills. We're not born knowing how to use a computer, despite what everybody would like to think, right? We're born knowing maybe how to figure out how to play Angry Birds, but that's a consumer product. I'm talking about how do you create, how do you design, how do you engineer? Let's go ahead and go to my last slide. So this is kind of an interesting uh, image because this is J.J. Abrams. You guys probably know him from all of his awesome TV shows, Lost and all of those things. He keeps this box on his desk and he does that because it represents mystery to him. He never actually opened this box. This box is full of magic and he has no idea what kind of magic is inside of there. He just knows that it's magic. When we bring devices into schools, kids see those devices actually as this mystery box. They look at that device and say, this has unlimited possibilities, unlimited potential. And then what happens is if we don't use it to its fullest capacity, we don't get everything out of it and start turning them into creators, the mystery is, is solved. It's boring. It's no good. The teachers are frustrated with it because it didn't work. It, it was frustrating to them. And they tend to put that box away and they put it into that dungeon of the, the uh, classroom or the, the back of the classroom. You've all been in probably a classroom where you've got three computers and they're hidden in the corner, right? That's what happens. So what we want to do um, in, in Utah education is really transform it by finding new ways to really uh, kind of push the envelope, bringing computers to students that are younger, allowing them to get the prerequisite skills so that by the time they're in middle school and high school age, they're doing transformational type of work. They're doing work that's actually solving problems. We're going to let uh, younger students actually take a crack at, at things that we would typically think are way too big for them, right? Let them take a chance and let them uh, get that opportunity to really use that technology. And then when we hit that point, it's transformational. They have to have it. And you're going to see the need for broadband. You're going to see the need for computers grow exponentially because we're all going to want it. Now, my last note on this, by the way, is I, I've done this in a school, and we talked a little bit about the cost. In my particular school, I actually saw my cost decrease, my, my expenses. I spent a million dollars in technology in my school in my first year, and I actually decreased my overall expenses by 18%. And I'll be out here in a booth, and if you guys want to know more about how I did that, I'd love to talk about it. But there are actual cost savings that are involved, and we're getting preliminary data from iSchool, from some of the schools that we've already worked with. They're experiencing some very, very similar type of stuff. They're seeing some cost decreases um, in, in the form of paper costs and, and a lot of other uh, little different areas. And um, it's, it's not as scary as we think. Sometimes we look at those numbers and go, oh my goodness. When you really look at the grand scope of how much money is spent in education, that's, that's not a huge, huge number. There's, there's a lot of money out there, and we can do this. Um, and and iSchool is definitely here to help you guys. So thank you very much. I got my own. You got your own. Yeah. So thank you for having me today. I am Meredith Manabach from the STEM Action Center. Um, and you can actually just go to the next slide. For those of you who are not familiar with the STEM Action Center, it was created this last legislative session, and the legislators appropriated $10 million to the STEM Action Center to get technology into the classroom. Um, so specifically, we have $8 million to put towards middle school math software technology, and we have $3.5 million to put towards college readiness technology in math. Um, you go, oh, go ahead and, oh, thank you. All right. So this is the mission of the STEM Action Center. We really are trying to be a place for best practices in the state of Utah to bring together education and to bring together industry to see where we can be cutting edge in this nation as far as STEM education. And a piece, a huge piece of that is technology. Um, go ahead and. 
Okay, so apparently I was really tired when I put the slides together because I'm going backwards. Um, so you can see here the bill was created. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. So this is what we've accomplished so far. We have started a pilot in the state of Utah. We have 11 technologies that we are piloting across the state of Utah, math technologies in 68 schools. And so we have a really good represent representation across the school. Um, as across the state in schools. Some of the challenges that we faced, um, just for this audience, is the reality that there are schools with computer labs, but the likelihood of a math teacher having access to that computer lab is um, pretty dismal. Those computer labs are traditionally set aside for English teachers and for business teachers, and so math and science traditionally do not have access to those computer labs. So here the legislature is wanting us to put technology into all of these schools, yet the technology, the software, can't be used by the teachers who need to use it. Um, and the bill specifically says we cannot pay for hardware. Um, so this is an area where we have reached out to industry and to business to come and partner with the STEM Action Center and really help these schools get the hardware and the technology that they need. A couple other challenges is even if we put the technology in the school, then there is not the Wi-Fi signal that is strong enough. There's not the bandwidth there to support um, more classes being on a computer at the same time. Um, other little challenges that we've had, one of the softwares, uh, math softwares that is just having huge success in a lot of the schools. There's a school in Wayne County that we want to use this and they actually have iPads. We cannot find an app that they can access in a school um, to allow them to run the flash drive that is not rated 17 plus or lower. So the school district won't buy the app to allow the flash to have them access this math technology. And we have a whole team of people working on this to try to find. So those are just some of the challenges that we've come across. But we are working with industry, we are working with school districts, we're working with Utah State Office of Education and higher ed and UCAT um, to really bring all the partners to the table and really find the solutions for education um, in the state of Utah. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. Um, go ahead. So, so as I've mentioned, our vision is really to build a pipeline for the next um, generation workforce. We have a governor is, who is committed to economic development. We have um, the governor's office of economic development who works tirelessly to bring industry into the state and to create jobs. But we are starting to hear rumblings that we do not have the workforce for those industries that are coming into the state. So we really have to start looking long term. This isn't going to be an overnight solution. We're not going to have our 10th and 11th graders now possibly ready to enter the workforce in four or five years. We really have to look long term in middle school and elementary school. And what are we doing at those levels to, to ready our kids for a workforce that is going to be so technology dependent? And then, so if we work on elementary school, are we building the middle school to be able to handle now these kids that are advanced? And are we preparing our high school to, to handle these kids that are more advanced as they're coming along the pipeline? Um, go, ahead and go ahead and go to the next one. So these are just some of the strategic objectives um, for the STEM Action Center. We really want to partner. We want to promote STEM. We want to motivate we want to um, educate. We really, we have partnered with Comcast and this is an opportunity again where we've asked businesses to come to the table and we are going to be implementing a whole marketing campaign to really change the conversation around STEM. We really have to look at this technology piece in the broader picture of STEM and not so much continue to teach science, technology, engineering, and math in silos. It really has to be cross-curricular. We really have to look at preparing our teachers on how are they using technology in their classroom, if it's available, getting it available to them. How are they using it in math? How are they using it in science? What kind of science conversations are they having in math? When they're doing art projects, how are they bringing math and science into those conversations if we truly want to develop a workforce for the next generation? Um, go ahead. And I think that is it. So that is the STEM Action Center in a nutshell. Um, 
we are focusing on math this first fiscal year. We are going to the legislature this next year, really asking to broaden our focus so that we can be the STEM Action Center and not the Math Action Center, um, knowing that math absolutely has to be a fundamental in all of this. But I know we're here to talk about technology and broadband, so I think we'll turn it back to you for questions. Okay. So uh, let's talk about the transformation that's needed, okay? Uh, I just, one little thought goes through my mind. I think you can see by looking at me, I, I probably started in school without computers and typewriters were uh, pretty rough actually um, for me to learn. Um, but you know, you think back to the workplace, let's go 30 years ago for a few of you. And uh, there was that whole conversation that started maybe 25 years ago. Does that person really need a computer on their desk? You think they do? Um, and then suddenly they're everywhere. So to me, they're almost selling themselves. And to me, it's surprising that the schools don't have them for almost every student at this point. Because you know they're going home, most of them. We had 97% of our state has access. 97% uh, are probably going home and doing their homework on the computer at least. So. Anyhow, uh, let, let's talk about the transformation. You got some questions. Yes, sir. Um, I think you can speak to this, but what about the two thoughts I have? What about a two to one computer convenience bill? Most of us have more than one device. <laughs> the other question about it is is that also kind of brings up the question about thoughts on getting your own devices? Hmm. Or so, everybody in the back hear the question? Okay, good, good. And what you, you know, I have a couple thoughts, I'll, I'll turn it over, but um, you know, yeah, the more technology they can have, obviously the better. Uh, that's just, that's my philosophy. So, you know, take it for, for what it is. Um, and, and to kind of answer your second portion, um, w can you rephrase it again? Yeah, and, and BYOD is an interesting animal, um, and, I, and I'm fully in support of, of BYOD because I want anything to be brought into the classrooms. I really want technology, but uh, BYOD is a very challenging thing for a teacher because you end up with the lowest common denominator in that classroom. So if I've got three, three students with a Kindle, and I've got a bunch of other students with um, iPads and, and you know on up the chain, right, then what happens is I have to play to the limitations of that lowest device. So the Kindle can surf the internet. So that's where I'm left. So now I can use the internet and maybe a limited part of that. That's not, again, a very transformational type of technology yet. So it's, it's very, very difficult for even BYOD to be you know, uh, a great in the classroom. And, and it becomes a frustration so it, where it actually stops the teacher from being able to, to function as they might like to. So the teacher is going to say, hey, I've got these strict standards I've got to meet. And the technology is now getting in the way of me doing the things I know will hit those standards. And then they'll say, everybody turn them off. And they're going to put them away for a couple minutes so that they can get their work done. So BYOD has definitely got some challenges. I'm in support of it, and I'm in support of all the people that are working very, very hard to make it work because I think eventually that, that is probably the model that you'll see. But we got to wait for some of the devices to kind of catch up so that the lowest common denominator is actually functional at the level that is needed. The, the current way of doing a one-to-one -one where it's all a common device is much, much better for schools and we're seeing a lot more success because they can all function on the same level and do the same types of things and work on the same apps. And like you were saying, you, you've got this issue where you, know, you have a specific you know, thing you want to do and if the technology can't do it, now it's, you know, let's put that aside and we'll go back to the, the pen and paper. And that's really why it's not moved forward in the, in the years past. Yes. In terms of that, you know, just as a recess, you make comments that most of the kids are going home and doing something at home, and we don't know why they don't have computer service or their classes. Well, at your house, we don't have six computers. We have six phones, and they all share one computer, or maybe two. So going back to this time, then, what's your vision on the? 
Well, it depends. I mean, like on a device like this, it's all done on this device. So video shooting, editing, all of it, it can be all done. But if you're going to get, if you're getting into the more advanced type of things, you know, in, in every school that we put in, we do put in computer labs. And those computer labs are, you know, um, anywhere from 30 to 60 per 500 students. And there are things that, you know, we can't do. In, in my school in, in particular, we did uh, computer coding. Um, we felt that was better for the computer labs, and we did. We rolled them into a computer lab. Um, you know, but there's, there's a couple things with that. The state of typical computer labs is, is aging in some of these buildings, so even those computer labs need to be kind of refreshed. But you're right, you can definitely bring a device to do some things. It's just, again, what are the limitations on that device? What are, you know, what are you working with? If, a, if you say, okay, everybody open up uh, a, you know, a web browser and the students all have different web browsers, it's a, it's a challenge for teachers to be able to get them all to the same place. And that's, that's where teachers are, you know, it's one versus 30 to them and, and they have a tough job getting everybody onto the same thing if it's not all a common device. Okay. Question? You know, in answer to that, that was a lot of the a lot of the th issues you bring up are exactly the reason that we sat down, uh, you know, a year and a half ago to put together the technology standards for districts and schools, is to help them as they're starting to look forward to make thoughtful planning. Because I think it's you ha you have to go through this planning process and you have to have a vision, and then you've got to be uh, and then an implementation plan to be able to make this happen. You've got to start looking at what is it that you want students to be able to do with the devices that you might be providing for them. Is it that you want them to just be able to do basic office, you know, applications, or do you want them to have uh, media, uh, you know, media production capability as well? Because that's going to drive a little bit the kind of device that you might need. So I think that's a part of that planning. And then I think you also then have to look at, when you've, once you've decided on, okay, this is what we want to be able to accomplish, then you've got to be able to look at the system in, in, you know, from the professional development standpoint that what do we need administrators to know that they're going to be able, they're going to have to know and be able to do to be able to guide this in the building. And then what are the teachers going to have to know? And then how are you going to, to fund that? How are you going to get those teachers that kind of training? Is it going to be an after school workshop? Is it going to be, you know, is it going to be some kind of systemic uh, co course that you're going to run them through in, in cohorts? But you have to also plan for the professional learning of all of those that are going to be uh, involved with that. And then, of course, you know, it's a little bit like the systems that you know, talk. We've also got to look at the technical support side of all of this to be able to make sure that those systems are always up and running. You know, you can't come into the building that day and say, oh, the network's down today, sorry. Um, or, you know, your, your, device is, you know, your device has gone down. Uh, that'll be three weeks before we can get it back to you because now you've all of a sudden put the you know, you know, you've all of a sudden shut down education for at least one individual. So these are the kinds of issues that, you know, you, you do have to address as you're moving forward. And just to add to that, to give an example, there is a um, master teacher, a science teacher here in the Valley who just got a grant to have one-to-one -one iPads in her science room. Um, and she has every endorsement there is possible to have. She has enough credits to have a PhD. Um, she is a master science teacher. She's amazing, but she's never taught science on an iPad. And so she is now having to go to two hours um, every week for the next six weeks to learn how to use these iPads in her classroom. So that is a reality of how are we training these teachers to implement technology in the classroom um, when every year the legislature defunds professional development for USOE. Um, and then we also have to look at the teachers coming out of higher ed and bring higher ed to the table because currently anybody graduating with a teaching certificate to go teach K through six doesn't have to have any kind of technology class. And that's to date. And they have one semester of science and one semester of math. And so um, we need to, and the STEM Action Center and USOE and Utah Higher Ed is coming together to talk about these issues 
and figure out how we change these things going forward. Question. Yeah, and I agree with that. It's not it's not a device specific thing, by the way. The reason iPads comes up is because iPads right now have, you know, those prerequisite skills that I told you about. It has kind of transformed the classroom in the fact that the teacher has less prerequisite skills to cover with the kids, because your your point about the teachers needing the training, which they absolutely do, the students need the training as well on how to use technology in the classroom, how to use it appropriately, how to make it productive. So the teachers have to be able to teach technology at a certain level as well. And so, yeah, device specific, you could you can throw any, I'm not a proponent of any specific device, but there's a lot that goes into, you know, bringing in the classroom and, and that, that transformational thing, that SAMR model is what really has halted it um, altogether because if it's not transformational, we just go back to pen and paper. Question over here. And I don't want to promote one device or the other, but the reality is there are grants out there for teachers to get iPads, and so that's what they have access to. There aren't a lot of grants for other kinds of devices. Well, and the, bro and the broadband issue is, you know, that you bring up is really, you know, for this conference is really important. And I think, you know, Jeff did a great job in being able to, to, to show how, as a state, over many years and working collaboratively, uh, you know, as a public-private partnership, been able to create this very robust network, which has very good connectivity to the building. It's when you walk inside of the building on the other side of that that that's when we have to we have to also be looking at how do you create the internal network the internal structure infrastructure to take advantage of what is coming what is coming to the door then you can start really start you know you then you also have to look at the you know the devices that are uh, that are going to be attached to that but those have implications uh, for uh, all in, in, in that planning process that you have to look at all of those elements not just the device. We had schools that actually were buying iPads and didn't even have wireless networks in their building. Uh, so we had a question the device could do everything. I think it's a good question. Go ahead, Jeff. I, I was just going to kind of just tag on to that. I, I think that's a, you know, a, a great question because uh, kind of even stemming on to Cody's comment about what does the what does the student have at home? And so if you if you go into a school, you have broadband there, you have good access. Uh, you know, there's an 80 plus adoption rate of iPads, so there's probably a l significantly more solutions developed for the iPad when they go home. Do they have the tools, the access, the kind of solutions they need to actually do their homework, do what they need to do to, to uh, fit in with what they need to go back to the smart school and be able to uh, uh, accomplish? And, and yeah, what, is that, what does that access look like in the home really for the, for the student? Just to, to tag along to that, you know, because that, that, that access at home I think really is important. And obviously there are uh, programs, you know, for, for lower income, Homes that typically would be the ones that you are most likely not to have it. Uh, both CenturyLink and Comcast, in their service areas, do offer uh, low-cost uh, access to broadband uh, for for people in that. Uh, interesting. I was talking to Dr. Deborah Hill yesterday from Southern Utah University. She just got back from Finland. Uh, spent six weeks in Finland on a fellowship there, and she was talking about access to to broadband there. 
And in every city she was in, there was free wireless. Uh, whether she was in the city or five miles out into the country, she still had access, there was always access to, to uh, broadband. Interesting. Another question, yes. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure if Sabrina Scott's here. I do know there, there have been ongoing discussions because of, of ensuring that they're recognized as, as libraries because I believe up to within the past couple of years discussion regarding the, the chapter houses, community centers, and how, to the, how do they uh, uh, qualify in those terms. And so that discussion has been ongoing. I think Sabrina is probably the most uh, up to date on that, unless Melinda, you have information that you can share. But that was the last, because we've had an interest there, that was the last time I heard is, did it actually qualify and recognize so that we could actually qualify for E-rate uh, and, and, uh, and help connect those locations? And that's where I think that, that uh, gray area is right now and, and uh, Melinda do you know do you have kind of current where that that stands with the libraries the, the, the I think that, yeah, we, we need to keep that discussion moving forward because we've certainly talked in the past about Navajo Mount, Monument Valley, uh, Montezuma Creek. We did uh, work with uh, White Mesa recently, but it wasn't uh, positioned around the fact that they had a library in the community center, but it was really working with Utah State University and that community center for access to distance education. And so just very recently now, a connection has been established to White Mesa working, partnering with Utah State uh, uh, Eastern out of uh, Blanding, Utah to, uh, to do that. Okay, great questions and a great session. We thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. Thank you.